Hi, I'm Jez Taylor, I run the Market Garden here at Dalesford and I, um, as part of celebrating National Composting Week, I'm going to talk about how we make compost here at Dalesford. Uh, making compost isn't rocket science, however it can be quite laborious uh, and messy, so you have to commit a certain area of your garden or your farm site to collecting materials to make compost. We've got these brilliantly designed bays which consists of RSJs with sleepers slotted in between to kind of collect material. But if at home you wanted to make something similar or on a smaller, small holding, you can actually create something quite significant with pallets and vertical posts. You basically need to contain compost material. And it's important to have a significant volume. Uh, otherwise, there's a the potential for compost to dry out. And what compost needs, or rather what we need to achieve the composting process is air and moisture to encourage biological activity to break down organic matter, cellulose, uh, in order to realise compost. So, what do you find? We, th we find ourselves in bay number one, the active bay here at the Market Garden. And this is where we collect materials for somewhere between three or four months. Uh, and we occasionally will mix them and then we will take them into the next bay and mix that, keep mixing that, and then go to a final bay before we start using it as potting compost. But I just want to go through the ingredients that we add to the compost heap here at Dalesford. Uh, this is obviously not been turned, so this is what's been accumulated over the last week. We have kitchen waste, onion peelings, um, bits of celeriac end, somewhere in here, oh yes, carrot pulp. When they make stocks up at our ready meal kitchen, the fibrous material they take out off uh, the juice, the consomme element, doesn't get thrown away, it comes back here. And this is brilliant because it's nice small pieces that contrast well with the bigger pieces. And when you're making compost, it's all about a mixture of different size elements. So we have the grass cuttings that have come off the various lawns around the place. That's lovely. Big problem at home when you're making compost or in a lot of people's um, like errors in making compost is they base their compost around simply using grass cuttings and what happens is that they start to rot and they go very slimy and you end up creating a capping layer on your compost heap which stops air getting in and the, the, um, the grass just goes very slimy and gooey and doesn't really make very good compost so if it ever, ever happens to you just mix it with some leaves or dry matter uh, and then it should come good eventually or oh, I'm stuck. Right, other elements, quite bulky items, old floral arrangements. They will break down. Branches, don't really like that. This woody material takes a good three years to break down. So we tend to try and remove that. Um, unprinted cardboard. This is great. A lot of cardboard that we use in horticulture comes to us unprinted. However, the sellotape used by less informed uh, manufacturers, because you can get a biodegradable tape these days. Uh, this tape is actually plastic, so this needs removing to make decent compost, and all that will break down really well uh, in our compost. We also uh, at Dales would have a um, what is it? It's a wood burner, a biomass boiler, and that generates ash. And that is high in micronutrients, which are very useful, particularly for fruiting crops. So I'm going to scurry up here and get you a sample. There you go. The ash. Now, if you just apply that in a large dose in your garden, like um, you, you clear out the fire grate in your garden, it's not actually very useful. It doesn't actually, it's actually quite, can be quite toxic, but spread out and dispersed with other organic matter and diluted, it's actually a brilliant source of nutrition. And it's one of these things that gives us confidence that our compost has got a lot of micronutrition in it. Right, so the compost heap uh, being made, it needs turning quite often. Uh, and that is the physical element to managing a compost heap um, properly. Now, a lot of people at home, what they do is they have a dump where they put garden waste in, grass cuttings, hedge trimmings, old dead 
bedding plants, what have you, and vegetable waste. And then they would just eventually, um, the heap gets bigger and bigger, and the older part of the heap is where you can dig out relatively useful compost. People tend to get really kind of fed up of digging when they start hitting branches. Well, not, that's not a very big branch, but if you hit a big branch, it slows down your digging. Uh, so discipline in not putting woody materials on your compost heap is a very good idea. But also um, just making sure that you have some, somewhere to turn it, you have enough space to turn your compost heap. Uh, and the more often you turn it, the quicker it will compost. The municipal waste compost, the, the stuff you can get at the tip, that is often only three months old because it's turned every week after it's been processed into small uh, wood chips and small, um, just it gets chopped up before it gets composted basically. And so if they can do it in three months, you could do it in three months. That may not be your intention. You may quite happily hoard organic matter of various types and then just take from it once a year when you need it. Uh, Either way, it doesn't really matter. As long as you're avoiding putting useful organic material into landfill, then it's, it's got to be a good thing. Right, let's go and have a look at the, the compost once it's composted. Right, this is bay number two. This is a uh, material that was uh, accumulated probably between October and January uh, of last year. Well, of the previous bunch of months. Uh, it's been turned lots of times, more recently it's been turned so it all, everything's dead apart from a few weeds that are growing on the top. But if I start digging in here I should be able to find the evidence of effective composting. You can see quite a lot of um, fibrous material still here, the leaves are still intact but those elements that are quite small are full of whirling worms. Gorgeous little worms that are a clear indication that you don't have anything horrible and toxic in your heap. If the whirlings are there getting on with the job of breaking the compost down that's a, a really good sign. Um, they will just come especially if you build your heap on top of soil or turf the whirlings will come. We actually build our heap on um, a concrete base and that is the, for the ease of mixing which we do with a, a tractor with a bucket. So when we scrape the concrete we can effectively turn the, uh, the compost. But because we will always add some of our previous compost to a fresh uh, mix then we will take the whirlings from one pile to the next. So some people like to talk about inoculating your heap with elements. Um, some people like to talk about activating your compost heap. Indeed, urine is a famous uh, compost activator and many a gentleman of horticultural bent has often let himself out of the house in the evening to say, I'm just going to activate the compost, which is uh, maybe more information than you're expecting today. But a useful nutritious resource often wasted and that's what composting is all about. Okay let's go and look at the heap of the um, year old compost and see what it should, should look like after a year. Bay three, year old compost, this is when we can take the compost, break it up into smaller bits essentially and start using it as a potting compost. We mix our own compost with some bought in compost which is based on bracken and sheep's wool uh, and that is quite nutritious and gives us the confidence uh, if we, when we mix it with our own compost that we're actually getting quite a good product and we, we we're very happy with our compost actually our compost is full of very interesting elements like, and all these things like eggshell uh, they all add slow release nitrogen fertility to the compost so it's a good compost anyhow I digress. At this stage you notice how during the compost accumulation phase there has been elements of lax input. For example, old rubber glove often used by kitchen porters. That comes out. Uh, mm, the tape off a cardboard box. It's 
no good, is it? That comes out. Um, ah, what's that? A little bit of agricultural black tarpaulin. No good. Anyhow, what we actually do when we're accumulating um, to, to break down our, our compost into something that's crumbly and friable is we tend to run it through um, a potato lifter and that has the effect of turning it into something quite, quite small, essentially it's like that, quite crumbly. However, when we're making potting compost, because we do make a little bit of potting compost to sell, we have to make a little bit more of an effort because it's really upsetting when you sell compost and people are expecting not to see bits of gravel and elastic bands. So we sieve it. So we have a bit of a vintage sieve. We don't actually sell a lot of compost, which is good because I want all the compost to stay on site where the nutrition is useful in our growing scheme. Sieve, I think you might call that a half centimetre grid. Lovely looking friable compost with foreign bodies in the sieve. Rough it up a bit. This is very good for core stability, so I've heard. Some of my staff are just complete fitness fanatics. And if you convince them that what they're doing can improve their physical fitness, they'll do it just because of that. Anyway, I motivate by various means. Get rid of those bits, and you're left with Oh, you need to see this. Can you see this? Lovely, friable, crumbly compost. The kind of which you'd expect to buy in a sack. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you can see this, but I'm just looking at lots of little bits of eggshell and recognising the history of throwing away here, here at Dalesford. There is a pumpkin seed. Pumpkin seeds are very fibrous and take quite a long time to break down. So we often find a lot of those in our compost. Uh, yeah, there you go. Um, compost, getting nutrition from waste, garden, organic matter. Now you, there are other ways to get nutrition from waste, organic matter in the garden, such as a, what might be called a compost tea, which is when you kind of do the composting process in liquid. Uh, it's anaerobic. Uh, which means there's no oxygen in there, and you, you're grating a, a soup. And if you've ever smelt vase water, when you've accidentally left a vase of flowers on a windowsill for two or three weeks, it absolutely reeks, and it's mainly ammonia that you're smelling. But if you take very high nitrogen uh, organic matter, such as nettle leaves, uh, or uh, comfrey leaves, or indeed grass cuttings, they're all high in nitrogen, leave them in a container of water for ideally say six weeks, then they will rot in that container of water. In fact, what the method for making teas is you push as much material into say a, a 200 litre plastic dustbin, push as much material in there as possible, top it up with water, put a lid on it. You might have to put a weight on top of the lid to stop it coming out. Leave it for six weeks, all the kind of useful nutrition will come out of that organic matter uh, and you'll end up with what is referred to as a compost tea. And if you don't want to give your money to the multinationals trying to sell you their useful essential tomato fertiliser, well hey, six weeks down the line you could have your own tomato fertiliser just by retting down, rotting a bunch of annoying stinging nettles from the bottom of the garden. So uh, composting folks, it's the